Camera's good. I think we're ready to go. Uh, so my name is Steve Buick. I'm the press secretary to the Minister of Health, Tyler Shandro. Um, we have a couple of guests with us today. We'll ask them to introduce themselves when they speak. Uh, the MC for today is going to be MLA Dan Williams. Uh, then we'll hear from the minister and guests. So I'll ask MLA Williams to get us going whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you, Steve. Thank you, everyone, for joining me today. My name is Dan Williams. I'm the MLA for Peace River, and I'm going to be emceeing the event today. Uh, I would first like to um, let you know that we're going to have our two guests make the remarks after Minister, Minister Shandro makes his. And thank you very much, uh, Christy Pubauer, the Executive Director of the Alberta Hospice Palliative Care Association for attending. Uh, and thank you also to Dr. Conrad Fossbender, the Scientific Director of Covenant, for Health, Covenant Health um, Palliative Care Institute for coming as well. So I'm very pleased to be the government uh, lead to engage with our stakeholders in palliative care in the province of Alberta. Before this government was even elected on a platform, we made a commitment, a top priority, to improving the province's palliative care. People nearing the end of life need access to quality services and compassionate supports so they can help them, um, themselves and their families to die uh, in the best case um, with, uh, with dignity all the way to the end of life. This announcement is going to provide funding that is going to help us raise public awareness of palliative care and how one can access it in the province of Alberta. We're going to continue to shift um, from hospitals um, into community home-based and hospice care at end of life and improve palliative, palliative care education um, for our healthcare professionals and providers. And we're also expand the, uh, the effective caregiving supports that we already have um, so that people can remain in their homes and communities for as long as possible at the end of life. The Alberta government remains committed to this work um, and today is only the first step with our announcement of $20 million. As we move forward, I, work closely, I will work closely with stakeholders and community organizations, individuals across the province or in groups um, working in palliative care field to identify gaps in the system and determine how best to fill those gaps. Together we will make sure that Albertans know when and where and how to access palliative care at the end of life and know how to plan thoughtfully and wisely for the end of life situations that they or their families may come to. With that, I welcome the Minister of Health to the podium to provide some more uh, comments and remarks on the announcement itself. Minister. Well, thank you so much, Dan, and uh, thank you for joining us here today. Thank you for emceeing uh, this announcement and for being with us today. Uh, thank you and good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm pleased to be here today to uh, announce the first step in our government's commitment to improve and strengthen palliative care in the province. Our campaign platform last year, as, as Dan mentioned, was uh, included $20 million over four years for palliative care. It's an important commitment, and I'm proud to deliver on it. Now, thank you to Dan for leading this work with our valued community partners on behalf of uh, the Alberta government. I look forward to hearing from all of you as we move forward and ensure all the actions that we take to, uh, to improve the supports for Albertans at the end of life. Now, the past six months have been extraordinarily difficult. The pandemic has changed how we live. It's changed how we work. But it has not changed the mission of our health system to give high quality care to every patient and to treat every patient and to treat their families with respect and compassion. Now that applies most of all at the end of life. And regardless of COVID-19, the reality is that we have historically not done as much as we could. And that's why, as Dan said, we committed $20 million to improve palliative care in Alberta. And so today I'm pleased to announce the first three investments to ensure Albertans with life-limiting illnesses, and those nearing the end of their lives receive the high quality palliative care that they deserve. First, Alberta taxpayers are providing $5 million to the Covenant Health Palliative Institute to raise awareness of palliative and end of life care. Covenant Health will educate Albertans, no matter their age, no matter their health, and no matter their stage in life, on how to plan for the end of our lives and, uh, or the, the lives of our loved ones. For many of us, this can be uncomfortable to contemplate death, to contemplate its aftermath. And so we don't prepare as well as we could. We don't write our wills. We don't choose someone to act on our behalf should we lose our health or become incapable of voicing our own wishes. We may not talk frankly with our families or with our physicians, 
and our healthcare teams to let them know what kind of medical care we want at the end of our lives. Covenant Health will work to increase Albertans' understanding of palliative care. They'll support us in having important conversations about end of life or advanced care planning and pave the way for necessary health and medical choices. Alberta taxpayers are also providing $1 million to the Alberta Hospice Palliative Care Association to expand its strong work to advocate for palliative care in the province. The association will use this grant to set, uh, set up in-person and online support groups. They'll also develop Alberta's first free telephone grief support program. The program will link people with a terminal illness and their loved ones to trained volunteers to talk about the struggles and pain or how to talk about and prepare for death. People who have lost loved ones will also be able to phone for counseling and grief support. The association will also expand their education workshops into more rural and remote communities so that professionals, volunteers, caregivers, and Albertans with life-limiting illnesses can learn more about what resources are available to us. The third and final commitment that I'm announcing today is that our government is ending co-payments on palliative care medications. In fact, this is a change that we made effective March 1st of this year. This means that patients covered by the government's palliative drug plan no longer have to pay for the medications that they need as they, end the, uh, or as they near the end of their lives. The palliative drug plan has no premiums. It's free to join, but it's used to, uh, it used to include co-payments of $25 per prescription with a cap of $1,000. Now, scrapping those co-payments will reduce costs for about 2,700 patients and their families a year, including about 2% who reach the cap. It will save them a total of $300,000 per year. Now, that's not much uh, when thought of in the context of the $22 billion per year that we spend on the health system uh, every year. But it's not about the money. It's about respect. Respect for families and doing something to ease the burden on them. It's easy to get blinded by the scale of the health system and forget what it's really about. It's about every single patient and their family. This huge system, all of these billions of dollars and all of this amazing technology, it's all about one thing, treating every patient with compassion, everyone. So this is a small decision in the grand scheme of healthcare, but it's one that I'm especially proud of. Palliative care patients deserve to live their last days in dignity, and free of pain, including at home if they choose, without worrying about the cost of prescription drugs. And I emphasize, if they're at home, because a key focus of all this work is to help more Albertans spend their final days at home rather than in a hospital. That's important to Albertans and it's important to this government. One factor that has distorted that choice is the disparity in coverage of palliative prescription drugs. They're covered if you're in a hospital, but until March 1st, they were not covered if you were at home. We fixed that, but there's still more to do. So, in closing, thank you to our community partners for helping to build a health system that supports people through the, throughout their whole life, including at the end of their life. I'll now ask Dr. Conrad Fossbender to talk about the work that Covenant Health will be doing. And following his remarks, as Dan mentioned, Christy Pubauer will be talking about the, the work that the uh, Alberta Hospice Palliative Care Association is doing as well. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today, and uh, I'll now have uh, Dr. Fossbender come to the uh, to the podium. Thank you very much. I'm Conrad Fassbender. I'm Scientific Director of the Covenant Health Palliative Institute. K-O-N-R-A-D, Fassbender, F-A-S-S-B-E-N-D-E-R. Honourable Minister Chandro, MLA Williams and dear colleagues, on behalf of our Covenant Board, Leadership Team and Palliative Institute, we thank you for the opportunity to contribute to this important initiative to support Albertans and their families when faced with serious illness, to support their families and friends when they are under significant stress. 
For many decades, Alberta has provided leadership with an innovative approach to comprehensive, integrated and coordinated palliative care. We can take pride in this model of care, that it has spread throughout Canada and is recognized as a preferred approach around the globe. However, less than one in five of us has an advanced care plan. Only one third are familiar with the term advanced care planning, and only one half are familiar with the term palliative care. It should come as no surprise then that only 10% of us have spoken with the doctor about our health care wishes. Every day, seriously ill Albertans and their families face many decisions about their care and personal wishes when they are at their most vulnerable. Every year, over 350,000 Albertans are hospitalized, more than 26,000 die, and one quarter of us provide a family member or a friend with long-term health care condition disability or aging need. We're excited to launch public and patient focused initiatives building on what we already know than to continue to improve awareness, understanding and access to advanced care planning and palliative care in Alberta. These grants will raise awareness, encourage important conversations and support people in their times of greatest need. In our first project, we will help Albertans navigate critical health, legal and personal affairs through a comprehensive approach to advanced care planning. We will help Albertans prepare to face their lives with clarity about what is important to them, to alleviate the burden on everyone involved so that family, their loved ones and their health care teams can work together in confidence. This grant builds on a solid foundation to coordinate and support activities across Government of Alberta Ministries, Alberta Health Services, Covenant Health and the legal services sector. In our second project, we explore the importance of looking ahead and supporting necessary conversations at the dinner table, in our communities and with our health care teams. We will develop evidence informed and practical tools to educate the public about palliative care, to adopt a compassionate community's approach in implementing and evaluating initiatives such as the Death Cafe, Dying Matters, Conversations Matter and the Conversations Project. The current pandemic has indeed reminded us that we can never let our guard down when providing support to patients and families when they are stressed and at their most vulnerable. We are committed to working with the Government of Alberta and our colleagues in supporting this critical platform to address the needs of seriously ill Albertans and their families. Thank you very much. Good morning. I am Christy Pubauer, K R I S T I P U C H B A U E R. I'm the Executive Director of the Alberta Hospice Palliative Care Association, and I am so pleased to be here. I would like to thank the Alberta government as well as the team at Alberta Health for all of their work in helping make this funding a reality. I also bring our thanks on behalf of our board our staff, our volunteers, and our many members throughout the province. For 30 years now, AHPCA has promoted public and political awareness about end-of-life issues in Alberta and supports the development and delivery of learning opportunities in palliative and hospice care for professionals, for volunteers, and for the public. AHPCA is committed to helping Albertas live life to the fullest while navigating end-of-life care. The funding will allow our organization to expand education and public awareness workshops offered in rural and remote communities for professionals, for volunteers, and for Albertas, Albertans who are living with life-limiting illnesses as well as their caregivers. It allows us to double the amount of communities that we are able to go into each year. 
By raising public awareness, the Alberta Hospice Palliative Care Association can help more Albertans learn how and importantly, when to access support, resources, and trained professionals who can help guide them through the stress, fear, and sadness of the difficult time. It will ensure that more Albertans know about the importance and benefits of hospice palliative care to improve quality and access in our province. This funding will also allow us to launch two new programs. The first will enhance our in-person, online, and support telephone, helping Albertans living with life-limiting illnesses to remain independent and receive care they can in their home and in their community. We will also be working and partnering with palliative care societies across the province to implement online and in-person programming to offer support and effective caregiving to patients and families, allowing them to stay in their homes and communities. Again, on behalf of the Alberta Hospice Palliative Care Association, I thank the Alberta government so much for this funding and for the impact that it will have on so many Albertans in every corner of our province who are living with a life-limiting disease, as well as their family and caregivers. So thanks very much. We'll open it to questions now for Minister MLA Williams or our two guests. Uh, I think we have several reporters on the line. Uh, we'll ask you to keep questions short, but we'll take a uh, question and uh, follow up. So first question, please. Our uh, first question is Rafi Bujikanian with CBC. Go ahead, Rafi. Good morning. The question is for Minister Shandro. Minister, this morning, 600 patients, families, physicians, and nurses and pharmacists have written to the government asking to reconsider ending funding to the opioid addiction clinic programs in Edmonton and Calgary. I guess my question is, why are you pulling funding for these programs? when we've seen scientific data that, that shows that they've been quite effective at what they do? Well, I'll say a couple things. Maybe with that specific program, um, I'll be deferential and, and refer you to Associate Minister Lawan in his office to be able to reply specifically to that grant. But I, I'd also say this. Look, we're um, I, the, the focus of this government is to include harm reduction as a part of its strategy, but also to say that we're no longer going to be a one-pillar strategy when we deal with the opioid crisis. We are now going to also include recovery options for uh, Albertans and their families and, and making sure that this system has um, a focus on the full spectrum, and that's exactly what we're going to be doing, including the, the many different announcements that Associate Minister Lawan has, has made over the last year, um, including the expansion of, uh, of, of treatment uh, spaces throughout the province and the, the new announcement recently regarding the, uh, the treatment community. So that's going to be con continue to be the, the focus, is, is uh, expanding our focus on the entire spectrum and the, the full amount of supports available to Albertans. Thanks, Rafi. We can follow up and get you a response from Minister Luan. Uh, did you have a follow-up? Yeah, I mean, I guess my follow-up is when you say you're, you're expanding the full spectrum, so does that mean that there will still be any kind of medicated treatment in these two cities once this program is over? Uh, what I'm saying is is that we are going to, this isn't a zero-sum thing, Rafi. I mean, is, this is, isn't that by adding a focus to recovery options that we're taking away anything from anything else. That we're also going to include the full spectrum of options for, for patients. Um, and I, I really reject the idea or the premise that this is a zero-sum game by including recovery options for, for patients that we're taking anything away. Um, so, yes, we're, we're going to include the entire spectrum as, as our strategy in dealing with the opioid crisis. Thanks. Next question. All right, next is Kevin Nimick with CTV. Go ahead, Kevin. Hey, Kevin. Hi there. This is another question for uh, Minister Shandro. We've seen cases at dozens of schools across the province uh, as schools are back in session now. Do you think that the a reopening plan is working, and are there any alterations that you're looking at uh, in the coming weeks to keep more kids safe? Um, I, I, yes, I, I do think that the plan is working. I think we knew that there might be some children who might come to, to school uh, with COVID. 
Um, but we always knew, and, and the, the work that Dr. Henshaw and her office, as well as the work that she's been doing with the, the MOHs throughout the, the province in, in AHS, uh, was to be able to make sure that we could reply very quickly to these situations. Um, and um, so, uh, look, I'm, I'm the father of, of two. Uh, they're this year um, entering into grades five and, and seven. Um, and uh, so uh, I have uh, faith in, in Dr. Henshaw's uh, guidance for our schools and uh, the work that she and the MOHs and the other public health officials are doing to be able to make sure that um, uh, our communities are going to remain safe. And um, so, yes, I, I do think that the plan at this point is, is working. We know that we're going to, to treat the schools the same way. Now, before the schools open, we were also monitoring um, the province on a municipal level. And uh, if you've ever gone to the map, we have the three different levels. There's open level, watch level, restricted level. We're going to continue to do that, but we're also going to have the same type of monitoring for our schools and the various school divisions throughout the province. So we are going to be looking at the schools when they need to, to move into a, a watch level and then going in and seeing where, whether there was transmission in the school or whether just a child brought it from the community. And, and if there was transmission in the school, what further steps need to be done to, because we're still learning about COVID, and Dr. Henshaw is going to continue to look at uh, whatever the evidence is that arises um, here specifically in Alberta, but through, throughout the world as well, to be able to make sure that the, the evidence um, is, is the most up-to-date evidence when she's updating our guidance. We are going to continue to update our, update our guidance throughout uh, um, our, our response to the pandemic, and that's, that's the right thing to be doing. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, Follow-up? Yeah, uh, you mentioned you have uh, children in grade 5 and grade 7. What have you heard from them about the safety in their school, about uh, mask uptake in their school, and, and how kids are ke keeping distance? Are you uh, confident as a parent that all is being done uh, that's possible within their specific schools to keep your kids safe? I do. I do, from, from the school bus and, and hearing from them talk about how the school buses are different. Um, they're both on buses, um, so they're both they're the oldest. It's his first uh, first time not being in the same school as his younger brother. He's going on to junior high, um, but but busing is different. Uh, schools are different. Lunches are different. Staggering of, of times for lunches are different. Um, for them, it's it's you know the routines that they've been used to for the last uh, six or four years um, are different, and uh, it's getting used to a different routine. Um, I think that's been the most difficult thing for for them, but um, I think they also know that. Um, you know, that the health system and, and uh, especially the public health officials throughout the province are doing their best to make sure that um, um, all workplaces in the province, including our schools, um, are going to continue to, to be, um, you know, following the guidance that's going to try and make sure that Albertans are um, uh, continuing to um, make sure that uh, the, the, uh, the spread of, of COVID in our communities is, uh, is as limited as possible. Thanks. Next question. Kenny Trenton with Kix FM. Go ahead, Kenny. Hey, Kenny. Hi there. Uh, my question is for uh, MLA Dan Williams. And uh, Mr. Williams, obviously kind of uh, interesting and cool to be a part of uh, something like this. Uh, first off, uh, what is, uh, you're going to be, you're appointed to consult with stakeholders. Um, where does it go from here and what are your initial plans in, in this position to decide how the remaining uh, $14 million will be spent? <clears throat> Thank you, Kenny. Appreciate the question. Ultimately, it's going to be up to the stakeholders um, as I consult with them as to where they think that money should be spent. So we're going to be spending a lot of time reaching out across the province. I'm going to start with the stakeholders that we've already invested in here today um, with Dr. Fassbender and Christy. Reach out through them um, and we'll be doing a fairly thorough consultation as best we can with anyone in the province, particularly groups that have uh, an interest or have worked in palliative care in some fashion or another. So uh, it's, it's a very big honor as far as I'm concerned because this is an issue that is unlike other health care will pass by every single family and almost every Albertan will end up dealing in some fashion or another with palliative care or end of life um, questions. Uh, so this is important that we as a government make it a priority which is what we're doing. Thanks. Follow up. Uh, yeah, and it's for, uh, for Minister Shandro, and I guess, uh, Minister, the first qu the question I would have for you is, is that uh, in terms of uh, increasing uh, access to palliative care in rural areas, um, is this something that's going to be possible, at least with this first step? Uh, well, thank you, and um, I, I, we hope so. I, I think that's going to be the, the plan for not even just um, 
Although you did hear from um, both uh, Christy and Conrad uh, the plans for, for this first tranche of, of grants going to, to their two organizations and how they're going to be using those grants. Um, but, but we do need to um, start with, with these grants and, and how supports for um, both patients and, and their families um, are extended to, to our rural and remote communities throughout the province. And that will continue to be, I, I hope, some of the feedback that, that Dan gets as well when he speaks to some of the stakeholders and, and how we can best um, expand our supports um, throughout uh, the, the, not just our major and mid-sized urbans, but also our small urbans and, and remote communities. Thanks for that. Uh, next. Next is Bill Fortier with CTV News. Go ahead, Bill. Hey, Bill. Hi, good morning. Uh, quick question and a quick follow-up. First question, just for in the way of clarification, when you say end-of-life drugs that uh, you know are currently covered in hospital will now be covered at home, specifically what drugs are we talking about? Is it morphine, pain relievers, or is it oh. all drugs being used at end-of-life? If someone... Five. Um, so, uh, I, I don't know, if maybe Dr. Conrad, uh, if Fossbender could answer that. Is, is that... Uh, Oh, sorry. Then uh, we may have to get back to you on, on the, the specific medications. But yes, the, there are, um, so the, the palliative drug program is one of our 22 drug programs that, that are government sponsored. As I mentioned in my remarks, it's a, a premium free, deductible free program, but there is a copay. Um, it, but it was only copay if you were in the community, and it was free if you were in the hospital. Um, so y you're right, we are um, ending that, that copayment for those you know, 2,700 families in, the, in, in a given year. Um, but the, the specific drugs that are, are listed in the formulary for that drug plan, we can get back to you with uh, the specifics on, on examples and on what drugs are listed in that formulary. Yeah. Thanks, Bill. We'll follow up. Uh, I think you had another question? Uh, yeah, one more question. Thanks, uh, thanks Steve. And um, uh, just uh, yesterday, Dr. Hinshaw kind of hinted that there's a new reporting tool on the way for cases in schools uh, and that more information would be available soon. Uh, I'm wondering if Minister Shandro can give a can shed a little light on that and give us any more information on what that could look like and when we could see that. Sure. Uh, so that, that's kind of what I was talking about earlier to another question. I can't remember if it was Kevin's or, or whose question it was, but um, it, it's going to be very much similar to um, the, the current tool that we have when, when we're um, monitoring uh, the province on a municipal level. Um, there will be a map. And it's going to be monitoring our schools and um, listing the, the outbreaks that we have in our schools. We just want to make sure that we give parents and teachers and in all Albertans uh, the most transparency that, that we can um, throughout uh, the, the, our response to the pandemic. So this is one thing where we, we feel that we can provide that further transparency and that further disclosure um, so that people can understand where, where they might be spread in their communities. Um, and so the, it, just like we are monitoring the province on a municipal level, we'll be monitoring schools and, and school divisions uh, in the same way, open, watch level, and restricted level. Watch level will be once um, the, the, the triggers that Dr. Hinshaw's office will be deciding upon will be met, then um, we would go then with the, the school division, perhaps even uh, those in the school, to try and figure out if there's any further measures that need to be done in that school or in that school division. Um, or even whether any of the, the guidance documents that um, are provided by the um, Emergency Operations Centre and Dr. Hinshaw need to be updated to, to help us um, better inform our response throughout the rest of the province. So that will be coming soon. Thank you, Bill. Yeah, thanks, Bill. I think uh, we'll take two more. So next question, please. Next is Michelle Belfontaine with CBC. Go ahead, Hi, Michelle. Michelle. Oh, hi. Uh, this is a question for Minister Shandro. Um, so getting to the uh, palliative care announcement today, we're hearing a lot about, you know, people being counseled and talked about, you know, end-of-life decisions. Do those end-of-life decisions include medical assistance in dying? Well, I, I would say this, that we do have um, opportunities uh, throughout the health system as well in, in our acute care facilities when, when somebody um, is having those, uh, those conversations or those requests. That's not specifically related to the grants that we're announcing today, but there are those opportunities. Um, and then AHS also has their, um, their helpline for, for those patients to be able to, to have their questions answered and understand which facilities in, in the province that's available to them. And uh, so it's not, not related to these, these grants, but that, that is uh, available through, through AHS for patients. Thanks, Michelle. Follow? Yeah, uh, well, I, I'm just curious about um, why the government of Alberta is providing $5 million to Covenant Health when Covenant Health refuses to provide 
medical assistance and dying, which is legal in Canada, within their own facilities. So I'm wondering if you could explain that to uh, people of Alberta. Well, I, I think because we're talking about something totally different, Michelle. I mean, we're talking about palliative care, and this is uh, our commitment to, to Albertans on delivering on that promise on, on uh, further $20 million in support of palliative care. Uh, why, why Covenant? Uh, that's actually a great question. Um, and the reason is, is because Covenant is recognized as, uh, as a leader. Um, here in Edmonton, uh, I'm sure you know that um, the, um, uh, the Grey Nuns is, is recognized as, um, for, for their clinical palliative program at uh, the Grey Nuns, is recognized as, uh, um, uh, I, I, um, how would I describe it, but um, maybe I'll leave it for Dr. Fossbender perhaps, but um, they're, they're known uh, throughout uh, the world for, for the program. They, they deliver there the Grey Nuns in, in palliative care. and, and um, so they're, they're experts at palliative care. Um, we are, are working with Covenant, and, and they're included in this first tranche of, of grants that are going out the door for, for this campaign commitment, quite frankly, because of their expertise when it comes to uh, delivering not just palliative care, but also supports for um, patients and, and families. And so that's uh, what uh, this, this uh, grant, this $5 million grant to, to um, the Covenant Health Palliative Institute is, uh, is for because of that recognition of their expertise in this area. Thanks, Michelle. Okay, uh, next, I think uh, we'll take one more. Final question is Lisa Johnson with Post Media. Go ahead, Lisa. Hey, Lisa. Uh, hi, hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, this is for MLA Williams. I'm wondering what specific stakeholders you're, you're going to speak to um, to work out the, the remaining 20 million or what's left of the $20 million in funding towards palliative care initiatives. And if any of that funding is going towards operational funding. This, this money seems focused on education and back-end support. Um, can, can you speak to that a little bit? Sure, Lisa, happy to answer as best I can. Um, now, as far as where it's going in the end, I haven't decided um, what I'm gonna report back to the government because I haven't spoken to those stakeholders yet. Um, and who I'm gonna speak to is really an open question. Um, like I said in my previous answer uh, to Mr. Trent, and I'm gonna start with the stakeholders uh, that we have here with us. Um, they have great networks, and we're gonna work through anyone in the province that has, um, as, a, as a group, an institution, or individuals that have any sort of interest um, or work in the uh, area of end of life and palliative care. So uh, I'm, I'm very open to where we want to go. By no means um, have we written out the conclusion yet. So whether it can go to operational funds or education or expanding home care and um, hospice care, those are things that uh, they're going to let the stakeholders let us know. Um, and they could go towards, the, there's, no, there's no parameters on it right now as to what it, what it does over the next uh, five years, four years, pardon me. Thanks. Uh, Lisa, follow up? And then I think we have just one uh, last reporter left in the queue, so we'll, we'll stretch and take one more after. So, uh, Lisa, your follow up, please. Hey, thanks. Um, this question is for Minister Shander. I'm wondering, I mean, I know Hinshaw new tool for reporting cases in schools. Um, we heard about numbers all over the map from, from different sources and, and social media sources as well. And, and Dr. Hinshaw spoke to this, um, particularly the threshold uh, for reporting outbreaks being five cases in a school. Um, so we kind of knew those guidelines already, but what would you say to parents who believe they've been left in the dark on reported cases in school communities by the government? Well, look, I, I think, as I said uh, previously today, um, that, that our focus is on making sure that parents and teachers have, have the most transparency um, as, as we possibly can. So um, what we're thinking about when we're thinking about these, um, these amounts is, is, quite frankly, is, is what's going to help um, in, in, um, in responding to, to COVID-19, helping patients, or sorry, not patients, but helping parents and, and teachers, um, as well as other Albertans. Um, so. Um, if, if Dr. Hinshaw um, feels that uh, that number uh, needs to be different, I, I think right now she's, she's looking at um, the evidence um, throughout uh, the rest of the world, and including here in Alberta, to be able to figure out uh, these, these triggers and these amounts. Um, and um, look, I, I think we've been successful in Alberta throughout our response to, to COVID so far because we've been listening to our, the medical advice of our public health officials. Uh, I think we have to continue to um, uh, be able to, uh, to make sure that they have the resources they need to give us the best medical advice available to us. So thank you. Great. And there's another Thanks. one. Thanks. Yeah, just you. one last one, and we'll wrap up with this final question. Yeah, final question is Dave Kaiser with 660 News. Go ahead, Dave. Hi, Dave. 
morning. Thanks for uh, taking my question. Uh, Minister Shandro, another group of doctors, this time 22 from Cochrane, penned a letter trying to clarify their dispute with you and the UCP government. Not about money, as the government uh, says it is. So I feel like it's only fair to ask you, what is the current dispute between doctors and the province? Uh, well, thanks. Um, so I, I'd say this. Look, anytime somebody says it's not about the money, it's about the money. Um, we have a framework that we announced on February 20th, um, a, a new framework that was ostensibly much the same as the old framework on how physicians were compensated. One of the changes we made was um, no longer um, having the authority of, of government delegated to a third party, which stopped the government from setting a budget. Um, that's not going to be part of, of any framework we have on how physicians are compensated. And if we continued with that old framework, um, as I've said many times, we set a budget for physician compensation, the highest level of this, uh, the history of this province, the highest level in the country on a per capita basis at $5.4 billion. Now, even with that uh, historical amount, $5.4 billion on how physicians are compensated, there would have been over the next three years a further $2 billion that would have had to gone to physician compensation. That would have had to come from the rest of the system. We only spend $2 billion on our drug programs. We only provide AHS with a $12 billion grant. Um, it would have had a significant impact on the rest of the system if we were con going to continue to see significant increases in physician compensation that we knew was not going to be tenable. So yes, we did take away that, that ability. We now have the authority of, of government brought back to set a budget. Um, how things are right now, on, on, Mar uh, sorry, on, on August 13th, we provided the Alberta Medical Association. Um, if it's important for them to have an agreement with uh, their signature and my signature on it, we did provide them with a draft that we propose. Um, and uh, they did provide us with uh, track changes to, to that draft. We're, we're going through that draft and look forward to being able, being able to provide them with um, our response to those changes. I think there's absolutely a way for us to continue to have a conversation with uh, the AMA and physicians. In particular, when, it, when we are, are very clear with them on having a budget for physicians at $5.4 billion, the specifics on how a budget is managed, um, very uh, open to the AMA and physicians and working with them to develop those budget management tools. So I think that's where the conversation can be had. Um, I look forward to continue to have the conversation with them. But look, any, uh, there, there's no opportunity for us as a government, it's just not tenable, for us to go back to an old framework that took the authority of government and, and gave it to a third party which prevented government set from setting a budget and would have had a substantial um, and, and adverse effect on the rest of the system. Let's remember that throughout the NDP and um, their term in government, physician compensation went up by 23%, uh, that physician compensation budget. While look at um, just picking nurses as another health profession, their pay grade stayed at zero for, for their, that time in, in the NDP's time in government. Um, and, and so understanding that further substantial increases in that budget just was not going to be tenable. It will not be tenable for this government. Thank you. Is there a follow-up as, as well, Steve? Uh, yeah, if you don't mind. Uh, I believe last time you and I spoke was about a month ago or so, and you had said you and the doctors haven't really spoken or fleshed out a new deal since their uh, uh, take yes for an answer campaign, which you said was more of a newspaper ad than an actual offer. Uh, have you spoken since then? I think that was about two months ago, and uh, you kind of touched base on it there, but what are the next steps? Uh, well, I, I think, as I said, um, the answer is yes. As I mentioned, uh, since we last spoke um, and since that newspaper ad, um, by the way, a newspaper ad that said take yes for an answer, but was asking for government to increase the physician compensation budget, right? Um, and so it, the, um, uh, since that time, um, we kept on hearing from the AMA that they wanted, um, by the way, let me remind you that we don't need um, physicians or not employees. They're, they're different than, for example, nurses or lab technicians. They are not a uh, union. We don't need a collective bargaining agreement. There's never been an agreement which set out how physicians are paid. They're, they're paid through legislation. And so this master agreement didn't set out how they were paid. Now, if it's important for them that they do want um, a portion of the, the physician compensation framework confirmed in an agreement, uh, as I said, on August 13th, we provided them with a draft agreement that, that would work for government. Um, we did, after we provided them with that draft, did sit down with them in person. 
Um, uh, there are two physicians who attended as well as their executive director and, and, and our office uh, met with them as well to set out um, what was important for government in a, an agreement going forward. Uh, they have since then, as I said uh, to the, the previous question, uh, provide us with some track changes and we look forward to giving um, uh, their, our, our feedback to, to those proposed changes. And, and as I said, I think there's an opportunity for us to continue a dialogue with the Alberta Medical Association, but it's about um, the specifics about budget management tools and working with them on trying to, I don't take a strong position on what those budget management tools would look like. And so I'm happy to work with physicians on, on how the budget could be managed, but saying to us that we have to go back to an old framework is un untenable to this government. So thanks very much. With that, we'll wrap up. Uh, thanks, Minister. Uh, thanks, Emily Williams, our two guests, and everyone who joined us online.